Uh, my name is Dimitri Jemerov. I work on the Kotlin team at JetBrains. And uh, before I start talking about the language itself, I'd like to just say a few words about our company. So JetBrains is a, actually a, a vendor of development tools and we have a, quite a, a broad range of products. So some of them are Java-based, uh, starting with our Flasher product, IntelliJ IDEA. Some of them target the .NET market with Resharper, .trace, and .cover, so productivity, code coverage, and performance profiling for Visual Studio. And we also have a, a range of server-side tools, so UTrack as an issue tracker and TeamCity as a continuous integration server. And uh, as for Kotlin, this is a statically typed JVM targeted general purpose programming language uh, developed by us and intended for industrial use. And by industrial use, we mean that we expect you guys to use it eventually. So it's not a research project, it's not esoteric, it's just develop, uh, de designed to be used by, for large projects everywhere in the in industry. So right now the language is not ready yet, so we have documentation describing the current design. Uh, and we welcome all the feedback on that, but you cannot yet play with that, so we plan to release the public beta for Kotlin in a few months. And during my talk, I'll first uh, say a few words about why we started Kotlin, then give a brief overview of the features, uh, how the basic syntax looks, and then dive a bit deeper into some specific areas of the language, such as the type system, the, how classes work, uh, the cool things that we can do with functions, and uh, Finally, uh, something a bit even a bit deeper, so uh, Groovy has this nice builders feature which allows you to build HTML or Swing or Ant or s uh, similar recursive data structures very easily. And in Kotlin you can do the same thing, but in a type safe way. So why did we start? So the work on Kotlin began uh, somewhere in the middle of 2010, and by the time we had a huge Java code base, so the IntelliJ IDEA code base, more than 10 years old, 50, more than 50,000 classes, very uh, huge amount of code. And all the time we have been building support for many nice languages, Java, so uh, Ruby, Python, uh, Scala, Groovy, and so on and so forth. But our, our own code was still written in Java. And of course we wanted to have a nice language, a nicer language to work in. And uh, the code base is not going to go any way away, so we, have to have something that's very easy to int gradually integrate into the existing code base. <laughs> and we also want to, need, uh, we also require efficient tooling, so we don't want to uh, waste our time waiting for the code to compile for a long time or struggling with inefficient refactoring tools or stuff like this. And none of the languages that existed at that time was a good fit for our needs. And so the design goals stem pretty much directly from our motivation, so we must have full Java interoperability and not treat it as a, for example, Phantom treats Java as a foreign function in foreign language. So for us, Java is not something foreign, it's <coughs> very closely integrated. We want to have a language that compiles it as fast as Java, uh, that is more concise than Java, that allows you to express more in less lines of code that prevents more kinds of errors than Java, so we kind of sick, uh, we are a bit sick of seeing null pointer exceptions and we want the language to prevent many of the, as many of them as possible. And we want to have a language that's way simpler than Scala. And uh, also since we are a tool, uh, developer tools company, then, tool, uh, then tooling is a critical issue for us. So because of that we are developing the plugin for IntelliJ ID in parallel with the compiler, and so it will always be fully up-to-date, fully compatible, and very stable and full-featured. Well, and by the way, yeah, we are, it's all going to be free and open source, so both the compiler and the plugin, and uh, the plugin will work for the, with the IntelliJ IDEA Community Edition, which is also released under Apache 2 license, so all the tools are free. And we will pro also provide a basic version of the Eclipse plugin. And another important note is on innovation. So, uh, uh, many languages, like for example Scala, they are major grounds for new research. And uh, Kotlin, unlike those languages, is not a research product. So we don't pl plan to publish any new papers. We don't uh, any papers. We don't plan to introduce any groundbreaking features. And if your first impression of Kotlin is boring, then that is the correct impression. So it is indeed boring. It's not. It draws upon features that exist elsewhere, uh, on features that come from Groovy, Scala, Go, and and so on. And so our own role in this is simply finding the right set of features uh, that work together in a nice way and uh, 
making, uh, making sure that the resulting combination is easy to use and easy to learn. So, so now let's look at the features that we have. So first of all, any language introduced in 2011, I, in my opinion, should have all of those features of so properties, closures, pattern matching, operator overloading, local type inference, so you don't have to put uh, map equals new hash map, so uh, it figures it out automat automatically. And uh, we also have some of the features that are not, not, not so commonplace, and so they, they like distinguish Kotlin from other languages. So first of all, we have traits uh, similar to Scala. So we have mul so they allow to have multiple implementation, uh, multiple inheritance of behavior. So in Java, you have multiple in in inheritance only for the declarations, and in Kotlin, you can also put behavior in those classes. You cannot put state, so it's not full blown multiple inheritance, but it's a reasonable compromise in most cases. We have extension functions like in C sharp. Uh, we have nullability as a first class feature in the type system, so for every type you can specify whether it accepts null values or not. Uh, very closely related feature to that is implicit casts, so after you have checked the type of something, then you can access the members of the, this type without putting in an, ex an explicit type cast like you have to do in Java. We have something that's called inline functions, so uh, you can use, cl uh, using this feature, you can use closures to implement uh, language features with zero additional overhead, so I'll, build, I'll talk a bit more about that later. We have reified generics for Kotlin types, so on the runtime you know what's, what the, for example, what the type of the list element is. We have first class delegation support, so you can, you, uh, if you can implement an interface and delegate the specific implementation of the method to another object. And uh, uh, one, the last thing is, th this is something that Java has been trying to do in Java 7, but they didn't get this to completion. And uh, we want to have this try from, right from the start. So a program in Kotlin is not only a piece of code, but also a set of instructions describing how to turn this piece of code into something that, into runnable software. So specifying the dependencies, the modules, and the libraries that you use. And all of this specification is also written as, a co is, as Kotlin code. So you don't have a separate XML file with, with the build script or something like that. So, of course, there are some features that I haven't listed, and there are some features that we haven't designed yet that we can appear in the language based on your feedback, but that's enough for a taste. So now let's see how it looks. So this is Hello World. And you immediately see that uh, uh, it looks pretty familiar, but some things are distinct. So semicolons are optional, like in many other languages. Uh, you can put functions directly into a namespace, so you don't have to put them in a class like in Java. Types are on the right. Arrays are just a library type, and there, are no, there is no special syntax for them. And this funny question mark dot uh, thingy is there because of the nullability. So, for, so system.out is a field in a Java class, and we do not know if it's null, if it contains null or not. So we have to reference them, this field in a special, with this special operator. And what this means is uh, it omits the call to print a len if system out is actually null. So in this case, it's probably a bit redundant, but in real life, it's much more commonly needed. Now let's look at something a little bit more complicated. So you see that you don't have uh, to put type declarations for local variables. They are inferred automatically from the initializer type. Uh, well, for loops are just like in Java uh, and just the ordinary like code looks like just code. Okay, so. And another feature that we, uh, that we have taken from Groovy and from some other languages as well is the string templates. So inside a string literal, you can directly put in uh, uh, variables or expressions using this do dollar syntax. And uh, if there is an expression rather than a variable, then you can put it in curly braces. It's very handy in many cases. Now, to make this code a little bit more efficient, we can use a string builder inside of just putting strings together. Uh, you see that these val things mean, mean that a var variable is final, just like in Scala. We have the same distinction between val and var. Uh, we don't use new for calling constructors. And here in this example, we are actually uh, overloading the plus equals operator on the string builder class, because in Java it's, it's not possible to overload operators, so this operation is not defined. 
And we are doing this in a, as, as an extension function. So everywhere in the Kotlin program which imports this, this function, you can use plus equals on a string builder even though it's a Java class and you can simply extend it as you need. And now a, bit, a little bit more realistic example. So there is usually no need to write all these for loops explicitly. You can write it in the functional style. So you just use the join function and pass, pass in a separator. And for a taste of how it's implemented, so this is the code actually implementing the join function. So you see that we have some generic types here. So we have a higher order function. So this for each function, it actually accepts a function uh, to which the elements of the iterator are passed. But all in all, it's still pretty clear and readable. So that was a high level overview. And now let's look at some details. So first of all, let's look at, uh, in more details about at our type system. So this, is, this gives an overview of most of the things that we have in the type system and how they map to Java types. And specifically, let's look at some details. So first of all, the any type in, uh, uh, in Kotlin, it means it, it's an equivalent for object in Java. And uh, when you see a Java, an, a Java object, then uh, in Kotlin code, it can be, we do not know if it's nullable or not null, so we have to uh, import is at as any question mark, and question mark means nullable. Uh, next important thing is the primitive types. So if, using, if you are using a not nullable primitive type in Kotlin, then it maps directly to a Java primitive type. So although we don't have primitive types as a special thing in our type system, on the runtime you get exactly the, sa the same performance as you have with the uh, uh, primitive types in Java. And it's actually very important for us not to introduce or introduce as little additional overhead on the runtime as possible. So you would not, uh, you would not need to worry to choose Kotlin because of performance concerns. It's just the same as Java. Uh, then again, uh, this, uh, and for an arbitrary type, we also do not know where whether it's nullable or not when it comes from Java. So we also map it to a nullable type in Kotlin. And finally, a more detailed look at arrays. So. Here, uh, when mapping from Java to Kotlin, we know uh, we have to mark the array itself as nullable, and also the contains, contents of the array is an, uh, as nullable. So, if it's, so it is a nullable array of nullable objects. And for primitive types, for some technical reasons, rather than writing array of int, we have to uh, use these special classes like int array, and there are uh, there, there is a set of those for all of the Java primitive types. And they map directly to arrays of primitive types in Java. Again, with no wrapping and no overhead. So this is a more detailed example of how null safety works. So we define this parse int function that returns a nullable integer. So it returns an integer if it was able to parse it and null it, and if it was not able to parse it. And you see that uh, uh, when you want to work with the result of this function, you cannot use the uh, the, for example, the multiplication operator directly. So you have to call this as a function with this, null, with this special nullable call operator syntax. Uh, because trying to call a uh, multiply statement on null will result in an exception, and we want to avoid that. But uh, also important to know that if you have explicitly checked for null, then in the scope of this check, you do not need to go through, to jump through any special hoops to, use, to treat this as a non-null value. So we, we know statically that this is not null. And uh, you can access it directly. You can call operators, the methods, and so on without any special syntax. <coughs> and now uh, this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, check feature also works for uh, type checks. Uh, so if you have checked uh, the value for, that is a, a value for a certain type, then you can call methods on this type directly without cost. So I've mentioned this already in the beginning. Uh, so you can use simply is checks, uh, which to check for a single type, or you can use this when uh, when statement, which is uh, actually a form of pattern matching, to check for multiple types or or check for some other more more complex conditions. So in the when operator, besides simple types, you can uh, check for expressions, you can check for ranges, and uh, you can also cust uh, sub provide custom pattern matching support for your own types, which I'm not going to demonstrate here, but it's available if you need that. Now let's look at classes. So this looks pretty clear, I think, uh, but still there are some immediate things that you should you notice. So 
there's this thing that's called primary constructors, again, similar to Scala. You put them outside of the class body, and uh, so they initialize the variables of the class, and they can immediately declare properties. So if you have a bean class, then it's all you need to do is to write class parent val p colon int, and it becomes the property of the class without having to declare it another time. Now, if you have a subclass, then you have to initialize your supertype in the uh, constructor. So, uh, like by calling it, again, the syntax is similar to what we have, what you have in uh, C++. And uh, we have made a choice that may prove to be fairly controversial, but still, uh, unlike Java and like C sharp, uh, all functions and classes in Kotlin are final by default. So, if you want people to be able to override your class or your method, you need to mark mark it with the open annotation. And if you are overriding a method, then you need to mark it as override. A again, a like in C-sharp, because it's a great help when, many when evolving code over time. I've mentioned traits before, so this is how a trait looks like. There is a special keyword for that. Inside the trait, there can be no state. So you can put functions in there. You can uh, uh, even put properties which do not have backing fields in there. But you cannot pro put properties with backing fields. And uh, in a trait, functions are open and abstract by default, so you do not need to put the actual keyword explicitly. And when you extend a trait, when you inherit from a trait, you can override the, the functions of a function, of course, that's, that's pretty clear. Now, if uh, in the case when you inherit the same named function from multiple sources, so for example, uh, so from uh, multiple traits or from a trait and a class, in your own class, you need to explicitly choose which of the impl ex implementations should be used. So you can either delegate to uh, one of the super implementations, like in my example, or you can provide your own implementation, or you can call, call both of the super implementations and combine, combine the results in some way if that's what you prefer. Uh, but the issue is that you cannot omit this uh, full method in C class, and omitting it would be a compile time error. Uh, this slide shows how delegation works in Kotlin. So the key thing here is that by p clause over there. So this means that all the method, uh, so in, inside the list decorator class, all the methods that are not, uh, all the methods from the list interface that are not explicitly implemented will, will be automatically generated by the compiler and the generated implementations will call the same method on the p instance. So you see that you can put an arbitrary expression here in the by clause, so you can just, you can call some methods to get the, uh, the thing that you need or something like that. And you can, of course, you can also override methods. So for this example, add some logging before the super function is called. And the super function, the, the super call actually calls the method on, P, on the P instance. So it's not exactly super, but similar enough to use the same keyword. Uh, another feature of the Kotlin class system is uh, something called class objects. So the thing is that uh, there are no st static members in Kotlin classes. So many cases where you want, would want to, to use a static function or static field in Java are covered by namespace level functions, and you can also have namespace level properties in Kotlin. But in some other cases, it's more convenient to use this class object feature. And uh, this is a bit similar to companion objects in Scala. And, uh, and uh, so the syntax for calling the class object methods is exactly the same as, calling, as for calling static uh, methods in Java. But the important thing is that the class object is an actual object. So it's a separate instance of an object that is associated with a class. And because of that, th that object can implement interfaces or, uh, or can be passed to other objects. So it's a separate instance. And in this case, we are implementing the factory interface in our class object, and we are passing the so we, uh, we, are, we are creating instances of ourselves in the, in the class object implementation. And uh, the case where it's particularly important is having generic, uh, generic constraints for class object. So you can have a class lazy with a type parameter t, and you can restrict that the t class must have a class object which implements the factory interface. And what this means is that uh, inside the lazy class, you can actually call methods on your type parameter. 
and the, me the methods are guaranteed to be there because of the gener generic type constraint. And uh, actually, the reason why this works is the feature called reified generics. So in, th in this example, we actually, ret on the runtime, we re retain the information on the t value that's passed to, to each specific instance of the lazy class. And so we know which class is it, on, and we know on what class the method should be called. And this uh, runtime type information can be used for specific type checks. So if it not so only can you check that an object is a list, you can also check that that is a list of specific instances. You can create a race of generic types at runtime, something that you cannot do in, in Java. You can, you can call methods on the class object, as I've already shown. And because we are not actually doing any VM level magic or something like that, so this applies to only to Kotlin types. And uh, Java types are erased. So if you have a java.util.list, then we do not know what's inside it. We cannot check for a specific uh, parameter type of the list, and it, it's just a list of something. So this has mostly covered our type system. Now let's look at functions in some more de detail. So you have seen some examples of first class functions already. Uh, now let's give a more structured overview. So this is a function. So this is the, de how the, the declaration of a function. And if you have a function, then you can also uh, speak about its type. And this is how a function type looks like. So you omit the name of the function and then use the same syntax. So uh, fun, the fun keyword, then the parameter types and the result type. And you can also put in the parameter names if you need that for documentation purposes, or you can omit them if it's not really needed for you. And th these are function literals. So essentially, or in other words, these are closures. So in a function literal, you can uh, either specify the full, uh, the full signature with the parameter type and the return type, or you can omit some of it. And if it, the types can be inferred from the context, then you can omit it entirely. So you just put the parameter name and the, uh, and the body. And again, because the types are inferred and this is all statically checked, uh, this, is, uh, this is not a dynamic call. This is a call that results in the correct type at runtime. So, I'm, so I mean that the call is resolved at compile time. So this is an example of using the uh, higher order function. So this is a filter function. Uh, should be pretty clear what it does. And here is how you call it. And to make this call, these calls nicer to write in some cases, we have some syntax sugar for function calls. So first of all, again, uh, so this is borrowed from Groovy. If you have a function literal as the last argument of a call, call you can put it outside of the parentheses. This, but this is particularly nice when the body in, in, the, in the curly braces is multiple lines of code, so you don't have this dangling parentheses somewhere down there, and it's, it just reads much nicer this way. Uh, this is again borrowed from Groovy. Uh, if, you have a single, if you have a function literal that takes one parameter, then you do not need to name it explicitly, and by default it's named it. It's not like underscore in Scala, because we don't like this underscore very much, but uh, it's the same thing, but with a better name, in, in our opinion. And this next point is infix calls. So if you are calling a function that accepts one argument, then you can uh, omit the dot and the parenthesis and simply uh, write the function name, uh, the uh, receiver, then the function name, and then the parameter. And this is actually a, an extension of uh, operator overloading because Operator uh, overload operators all simply resolve the function calls in uh, in Kotlin. So you have seen that the plus equals resolves to the plus assigned call, and so this is the same thing, but with actual names instead of the operators. And all of this allows us to write these uh, link style expressions in a rather rather concise way, even though we don't have any specific support for uh, integrated queries in the language. Uh, but even with the uh, the features that we have, it still looks pretty, pretty similar and pretty, pretty readable. Uh, now let's look uh, at uh, how we can use closures to implement control, uh, custom control structures in Kotlin. So you see this, this, is a, this is Java code and this is a very common pattern in Java code. So you have to, so some, uh, when you want to protect some piece of code with a lock, you need to take the lock before you enter the piece of code and you can need to release the, uh, the lock in a final block. And this is a bit verbose and uh, 
some languages like C sharp even have a specific keyword in the language for this for this pattern. Uh, now we don't want to have a special keyword in the language just for synchronization purposes. We want to have this as a, a library defined feature, but with the same syntax as, as it were a, a language keyword. So we have this lock function that takes a lock as a parameter and uh, the body as a function literal. And because of the syntax sugar, we can put the function literal outside of the parentheses. And uh, uh, now the only thing that remains is to ensure that it doesn't create any extra overhead at, at runtime. And the way we do that is by marking the lock function as inline. And what this means is that the Kotlin compiler will inline the bytecode for bo both the lock function itself and the closure that's passed to it as a parameter at the call site. And thanks to this, uh, so uh, the bytecode that, that will be generated from using the lock function would be exactly identical to the bytecode that would be generated by writing this lock pattern explicitly. There is no difference. So the, and because of that, there is no runtime overhead. So you see that's a, a very nice feature. So I've mentioned extension functions before as well, and now let's look at them, them in more detail. So an extension function is a function that has a receiver type. So the, uh, the, uh, so the receiver type is the type to which you essentially attach the uh, function. So in, in, the, in the previous example, this was string builder, and here, well, this is just some full class. And uh, in, inside an extension function, in the body of an extension function, you can reference in the instance of this type as simply as this, as the this keyword. So of course, uh, if there are functions, there are also ways to declare types of extension functions. So again, you put the type, which, is, which will be the receiver type on the left, and then put the fun function signature. And here are some extension function literals. So again, you, you see that you can use this, and this is optional, so you can simply omit it, and this toString will be resolved to a call uh, on the toString method on the full class. And normally, this is not exactly how you use them, but you will see soon enough how they are uh, used in a very, very nice fashion in the language. And uh, where the place where we use them is this, uh, the Groovy style builders feature. So this is, this is Groovy code. This is how, lo how they look in Groovy. So we can use the, so this is all dynamic code, uh, but this, the, uh, the essence is that you can declare the structure of an HTML file using these uh, method calls. And so instead of like putting some template code in, uh, inside uh, using some special template syntax inside a HTML file, you, you, you simply build the uh, HTML tree using Groovy code and builders. And of course, this is not exclusive to Groovy. Ruby has some, something like that too, and so on. And in Kotlin, you can do almost exactly the same thing. So you see that there are very little differences, uh, very small differences in the syntax. But the thing is that this is all statically checked. So we, at the comp compilation time, we know that the head tag can go into the HTML tag and the title tag can go into the head tag and so on and so forth. So this, this is all checked at compilation time and there is no way to fork code like this to generate invalid, invalid HTML. Now let's look at how this is implemented. So first of all, we start with decla declaring the top level HTML function and uh, yeah, so this is essentially a call to, uh, the first line is a call, in, a call to the function called HTML. And when we declare this function, we know that it has one parameter, which is a, a extension functions or function of type HTML. So this means that inside the body of the, of the block that we pass inside, we can call uh, methods on the, of the HTML class without, without putting in this or without putting in parentheses or without like any special line noise. So this head and body, these are function calls on the uh, HTML class. And the way we invoke this uh, extension function is simply by putting the instance on the left and on the right hand side, we put the function that, that uh, we put the parameter, so the function that was passed as a parameter. And then, uh, the, uh, then we, uh, the HTML class accumulates the genera generated text and then we simply return the instance. Yeah, and so you see that if you make it more explicit, then it's calling the head method, but you can omit this and simply put the head without this. 
So this is a bit more implementa uh, implementation code. So this is shows how specific tags can uh, specific tags and attributes can be implemented. And also you'll note this funny uh, string dot plus thing in here. So actually what we are doing is we are overloading the plus operator uh, for which has uh, tag with text on the left hand side and a string on the right hand side. And because of the extension function syntax, we can simply call this plus uh, omitting the left hand side, which becomes explicitly, uh, which implicitly becomes the, uh, this parameter passed, uh, passed to the extension functions and the right hand side is listed explicitly. So this, plus, uh, this funky plus thing means appending to appending text to the tag with text. So you see that it's pretty nice, type safe and concise. So this concludes my overview of the language. If there are, of course, we, we should have still uh, quite, quite enough time for questions and maybe even for some demos if there, are time, if there is time remaining. And uh, this is where you can go read the documentation. We have a blog where we talk about our work and the latest developments in the language and where we will definitely announce the compiler re better release when it's ready. We have a public issue tracker where you can sub submit us feedback and uh, just track the things that we are doing internally. And uh, once again, the feedback is very much welcome. It really drives the evolution of the language at th this point. And you can follow us on Twitter. And we have time for questions. Okay, so just I promised to show you some code. So this is actually an ID, so Kotlin running inside IntelliJ. So I would just, during the last talk, I just rewritten some dot samples in Kotlin and you see that this look, looks kind of similar. And you see that code completion already works in the plugin. And like navigation features like go to definition and structure view should work. And you can actually compile this and run it. So yeah, for example, this is one of my previous samples. You can run it from the ID and it's not very impressive, but it works. Oh uh, yes. So we simply integrate with our existing Java debugger and you can see that you can step through code and inspect variables. And step into functions. So essentially all the normal Java debugging interface, it all works. Sorry? Uh, at the moment, we have not done any work on the Eclipse plugin. We plan to do so, but it's probably going to be out sometime next year. Uh, not yet. So we definitely want to have a Kotlin-specific test framework, which, is, uh, which will use all the nice syntax that we have in Kotlin to write tests in a... So something we have in mind is uh, something similar to our spec in Ruby. So we, where you have this nested structure of specifications with setup code and assertions, and in Kotlin you can express this very, very concisely and nicely. So on the, on the runtime, all the Kotlin types implement a special interface which allows us to retrieve the type information for the type. And so uh, when you have a container, uh, then we store an instance of the, of the type information for the, uh, so if you, when, you have, oh, sorry. when you have a generic class, we store the information, the type information for the type parameter in an instance field of the class. So this is how Reify Generics works. And then compiled, at compile time, we simply know whether the type comes from a Java class or a Kotlin class. Uh, because when we generate class, uh, class files, we put additional annotations for Kotlin specific information like nullability and so on. We put this as annotations inside class files. Uh, 
uh, not yet. We will definitely want to have either simply a way to put Java doc comments inside uh, Kotlin code or our own documentation format. But we'll, we will probably go with Java doc because everyone, everyone knows that. Well, essentially, if you are doing an instance of on a generic type, then it, we translate it into a call of the on, or, of a function on the type info method, on the type info class. So it's probably a little bit less efficient than uh, simply an instance of instruction in the Java byte code, but the overhead is pretty minor in this case. Uh, so we plan to have something like the dynamic type in C sharp, where you simply declare a variable as, as dynamic, and you can then you can call any methods on it, and uh, it, it it will be resol uh, resolved via reflection at runtime. But there are some issues like with object identity when you do that, and we have not figured them out completely. So for now, we don't have any final design for that. But other than that, you can simply use Java reflection, and it works for Kotlin. So. The method names are exactly the same, and there is no translation. Do you have your own API? Uh, not yet. We will definitely want to have a custom reflection API if we have dynamic types in the language, because it will make it will be so much nicer to uh, than Java reflection. But for now, we don't have anything specific. What, what, sorry? TCO is a much better implemented on the VM level and I don't, so we, uh, we don't view this as, a, as a something essential for Kotlin to make hacks in the bytecode generator to make this work. So Kotlin is primarily, is more of an object oriented than a functional language. And with the style of code that you typically write in Kotlin, then TCO does not usually become necessary. But again, if, if it's implemented in a JVM, then we will, we will be able to make use of it as well. Okay, so thanks everyone. And